Welcome to the Dog Classroom. The Dog Classroom Podcast. I am your co-host, Anne-Marie. And I'm your co-host, Amelia. Like and subscribe on Spotify and YouTube in video format. And now into the episode. Here we go. Hello, everybody. As you can see um, to my left here, this is not Miss Amelia. This is uh, Mr. Mike, and he will be our guest um, for this uh, podcast. We thought that uh, quite a few people have been asking, who is Mike? (laughs) <laughs> and um, wanted to sort of see him on, um, I'd say on the podcast, but then also they ask about Instagram and Facebook and all that, because apparently they want to put a face with the um, name, especially when we talk about you in training classes and that sort of thing. So um, we're going to talk today a little bit about things to look for when um, adopting a dog. Right. Whether that be um, from a breeder, Um, we're going to focus more on puppy. Right. We had talked about we're going to talk about um, adopting from breeder and also rescue, but more puppy ish. Yeah. Expectations. Expectations. Yeah. Reason why Mike's in this or sort of in this area wanted to talk about this topic is how old's Augie now? Uh, 14 months. Oh, shoot. Somewhere around there. I was still thinking he's like eight or nine months. Yeah. No, yeah. No. I got him last December. Okay. December. Okay. Weeks, so. Yeah. Yeah. 13, yeah. 14 months. Somewhere around there. Okay. So how long did you research looking for a breeder <laughs> until you got? Yeah, I know it's a bit of a story. <laughs> Maybe you'll, you'll give us the short uh, version on that. <clears throat> Well, this this time um, I actually researched uh, for a different breed originally, right? Um, and found a breeder, and that took me probably a good six months or so of looking and asking questions and all those types of things. When you, when you mean looking, <clears throat> were you like Facebook? Were you um, well, emailing? So I guess um, to start with it, really, it's. I'm looking for a particular breed because I've researched the breeds and I'm looking for something that's going to fit my family. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, Busy family, have uh, two children, uh, work full time, do things like this, uh, dog training and whatnot um, to keep me busy. So I need something that fits into that life. The kids are at a stage that they've got all these other activities and everything. So I need something that... It's good in the house. We can go and do a whole bunch of activities together, but they're perfectly chill otherwise. So research the breed, come up with a Mastiff type breed. The first one that I was looking for this time was um, French Mastiff. Um, Keeping in the Mastiff line because I know how much exercise they need and all that type of thing. Right. So just to pipe in there a little bit and Mike's not going to... Mike did have a previous dog, um, Jax, who was a bull master. Yeah, yeah. so I, I didn't have to do as much um, research for breeds because I had done that already before um, to kind of find that. But that's generally what I'm, what we would want to do when we're looking for a dog is just, you know, looking up uh, what's typical of breeds. And so you can understand those expectations of when you're bringing that dog home and what you're going to get within a couple of years. Often people look at uh, the puppy phase and, you know, they goo goo gaga over this little tiny puppy that looks so cute and so much fun to play with and everything, but that doesn't last. It lasts even a couple months in some breeds, right? You're like uh, Jax and Augie at four months old, they were 45 to 60 pounds. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. I agree. Yeah. I think a lot of people get focused on the puppy phase and honestly, it does not last that long. Yeah. So you, you really got to think about how is this this dog that, you know, uh, hopefully for years is going to fit into the life and uh, into our life and what what's going to happen. So, um, you know, being busy like that, I needed something that isn't going to take four hours a day to exercise. Right. Um, so, you know, Mally's, no, thank you. I, <laughs> I can't do that. Uh, it's just way too much work. Yeah. Um, and Mastiffs, you know, um, within reason, they're pretty much, you can go 
quite a few days with just 45 minutes to an hour. And they're pretty much chill in a, the rest of the time, right? Um, so looking at Mastiff breeds was, that was my first step. And then once you, um, you're selecting a breed, um, then we start looking for where we can actually source these, uh, right. this breed from and um, what I would classify as a reputable breeder. And so I'm going to interrupt you for yeah, two cool. seconds. When you when Mike says Mastiff breeds, is there's different um, types of Mastiffs, right? Mm -hmm. So Bull Mastiffs are their smallest, mm -hmm. right? And then we got French Mastiff. Yep. Then just Mastiff. Yeah, Mastiff, English Mastiff. English Mastiff. Yep. And then we have... Um, Italian Mastiffs. Italian Mastiffs. Well. And yeah. then the Neapolitan. I'm doing this because oh, okay. they have huge jowls. That's <laughs> yeah. why. Sorry, I'm doing yeah, that. Neos, yeah. The Neo and yeah, big. Yeah, big. So that's when Mike talks about Mastiff breeds, that's what he means. Yeah, Molosser. If, if you're talking about like whole branches, they're, they're all within there. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that's the like, when I look at that, it's just exercise and what I can fit in a day. I can do my 45 minute walk, no problem. And, you know, it's not just that you interact with them obviously throughout the day, but, um, doing that little bit of exercise and we can still be a good household. It can fit, you know, my dog. Well then, yeah. Once they've else. had that exercise, then it's the cohabitation part. Yeah. 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 Okay. Then now you were talking <laughs> about actually getting, um, looking into um, individual breeders. breeders. Yeah. yeah. So uh, whenever we're talking about a recognized breed, um, which uh, French Mastiff or, or uh, Bull Mastiffs recognized by um, a kennel club or whatever, um, that's really your first step is going to those clubs, going to the associations that um, are, are for the breeds and, and looking for uh, contact information. And then going through multiple iterations of questions and both ways, hopefully, uh, a, a good quality breeder will uh, ask you a whole bunch of questions too. Yeah, I was going to say definitely from my experience um, with the with the breeders is you definitely want a conversation going both ways. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 So, so uh, for Augie, um, like I said, I was in contact with a French master breeder for um probably a good six months before i really felt like it was a good fit right um just talking about you know what they do um um like testing that they have done how often they breed um the pedigrees for for their dogs stuff like that and just trying to understand um how much work they put in um if they're going to create um, uh, a dog at the end of whelping that I feel has had the right uh, experiences, um, things like that. So um, experiences, <laughs> meaning um, some of the breeders have now almost started their own little like puppy program. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, when you get right deep into um, some of the kennel club uh, breeders, um, they have like they share information all the time, what works, what doesn't work over the years. And yeah, so it's like a community. Yeah, bit, yeah, yeah. And uh, whelping is huge. Like um, when we talk about uh, nature versus nurture and all that, it's very difficult to separate the two. But we do um, know that certain experiences that they go through <clears throat> um, can create a well-balanced dog at the end. Um, there, you know, we're always talking about, and I'm sure we'll talk about it when we're talking about rescues and stuff like that. But, yeah. you know, you know, there's always things that are inherited and behaviors that come from um, um, parents and stuff like that or, yeah. or bred into them like that. But, yeah. um, you know, making sure that they've experienced a whole bunch of experiences before they get to you. So they're comfortable with change in their environment and they don't get spooked about, uh, you know, small things or something falling on the floor. Or, yeah. Um, one, um, thing that I was, you know, grateful for when I got Augie was the conversation with, um, his breeder. Um, we talked about my plans, um, with Augie that he was going to be a uh, crate trained in that. And he started the work, um, which is, I think is huge oh, for yeah. like, owners because they, I find in doing consults or even puppy school, 
that um, they seem to settle a little bit quicker when you have the breeder start some of that like crate training, even um, house training, Mm -hmm. right? Like actually bringing them outside. That's actually a question I asked when I first got Fisher eons ago. Um, I think they were born like mm, February, March, but on milder days, um, the breeder made a point of bringing them outside just to experience the different sounds and yeah. yeah. The thing is, Mike's also saying like, it's not only just stuff in the house and uh, like people coming or going, like it smells, mm -hmm. it sounds, it's, um, you know, the different environments I find with some puppies, it's actually experiencing different breeds of dogs mm -hmm. sometimes too. If not, they think they all look the same, <laughs> right? <laughs> and you get this puppy that, you know, looking at other puppies going, what are you? <laughs> yeah. 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 So yeah. that's interesting as well. And same with different ages of people. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like with, with the crate thing with Augie, um, the big metal crates, like those are scary things that make loud noises yeah. sometimes when they yeah. bang into him. We, we brought him in the house and he jumped in that crate and went to sleep almost right away. Yeah. Like he was just perfectly comfortable with it. And, you know, that's because of all the work that the breeder did. Yeah. Um, during whelping phase, right? And, you know, if if you're really um, looking for something specific and need it to fit and, um, you know, you're setting your expectations to be able to, you know, have this thing that will fit into your life a certain way, um, you got to do the homework for that. Yeah. The yeah. flip side, though, is, you know, uh, rescues and... Um, any other way that you're going to actually uh, source a pet, you you have to expect unexpected in those situations because, you know, um, a, a rescue, for example, um, often in this area, anyways, they're coming from, you know, remote locations. Um, often they've um, uh, um, been bred in like outdoor conditions and. Um, they haven't had somebody watching over the puppies as closely as like a, a registered breeder would. Yeah. Um, so they might not get all those experiences. They might, or they might not get them and they'd be perfectly fine too. Like every, everything's uh, um, nuanced in that, but um, you can't expect that, oh, you know, the a reg our, um, um, uh, rescue tells you that it's a, a, a husky uh, shepherd cross. Well, you can't expect that you're going to get specifically that and what you've seen other huskies and other shepherds and even other husky shepherd crosses. You can't yeah. expect that they're going to behave the same way, um, settle into your house the same way or anything like that. Like you, you really have to be prepared to expect the unexpected and, and um, be able to deal with things um, that maybe you weren't uh, thinking were going to be a problem. Right, and I, when I'm talking um, with puppy owners, I try to encourage them, like if they're looking through a puppy for a rescue, I like to know whether the puppies like were brought in as puppies or was the mother brought in pregnant mm -hmm. and then the puppies were actually delivered, you know, in, you know, a nice, well, clean house mm -hmm. and mom was well fed and well, she's nursing puppies and the puppies well fed. Cause I think that is a little bit of a difference as, you know, how they're brought up rather than them sort of eating random, mm -hmm. random things that mom's scavenging for, or somebody's, you know, just throwing them scraps, that sort of thing. Um, you know, the other thing to look for is is doing a little bit of research too honestly with rescues you know again asking um the foster home right where different questions as you know was it a quiet puppy was it an outgoing puppy that sort of thing because you want to try and ask the questions to the person that's most been around right um more than likely you're not going to meet both parents, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So you're probably just going to um, meet mom if she was she was um, brought in as well. But I think it's sort of neat to say in some people are getting more involved into um, breed testing, right? Doing mm -hmm. 
the different, um, I think is, I think there was one still at um, LU. I don't know if they're still doing it, but I know there's some where you can register online and you do a little swab and it gives you a percentage Mm -hmm. um, of that to, to tell you when I got, frolic so she came from animal services um at first we thought she was one breed by looking at her but i went on at like six to eight months like innate tendencies that she started to do Mm -hmm. so she became a little um when she saw things she, she started to herd a little bit so go in behind and i'm thinking okay what's this and then she got you know a little bit nippy and she can get a little bit serious so it was like looking at different um, combinations there because I find sometimes with the rescues, you know, it's it's hard to tell. Like you got a little fluffy ball sitting there. Mm-hmm. But like you're trying to say is accept the thing that you're going for this little fluffy ball and you're going to figure it out and work through day by day to actually figure out the personality. Yeah, I mean, when... When you work with um, um, a breeder um, like I did, you can ask them questions about that breed and the tendencies yeah. and, and all those different types of things. So you can know those things ahead of time. Yeah. I mean, they're not going to be 100% bang on no. exactly behaving this way. That isn't how that works. But yeah. when you're going through a rescue, you you have to expect the unexpected. Yeah. Um, and often the folks that we see distraught in class that get rescues, not that I'm saying that everyone's like that, but the ones that have come in, I think that that's, that's the main issue with them is they didn't actually expect the unexpected. They thought that it was going to be easy and, and it turned out not to be right. They destroyed the house in the first three days or what have you, especially when you get the older ones um, coming in through rescue like that. We see that often, but um, and then just, you know, they get, like I said, they just fall in love with this little fluff ball and, you know, hang up that thinking part of your brain and, and you bring them home. And then all of a sudden that thinking part comes back and you realize what you've done and now you're in it and you got to figure it out. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, that's what we're here for too, is, is for those people and anyone else that needs to understand what's going on, how to address issues and all that, like come and see us so we can actually help. Right. So what I try to do is, you know, even though dogs are different breeds, right? And and we have, you know, all these, I don't want to say up and coming breeds, but, you know, we've had certain standard ones, golden retriever labs, that sort of thing over the time. And then you start to see some different crosses, that sort of thing, um, sort of coming out. But the idea is to um, be prepared, which is what you're talking about a little bit. So Mike was already talking about crate training, having the conversation. But I think it's also realizing like the actual maturity and time span of it. Um, again, I always joke when we're in beginning with basics or the next step that um, that's the hardest time, I think, in owning a dog as adolescence. So Mm -hmm. let's say eight months to two years, right? Where I honestly think a lot of people think it's puppyhood. I think after four months, everybody's like, woohoo, game on, dog's older, it's house trained. And I'm like, oh, just wait. Yeah. (laughs) Right? Everything starts sliding backwards. (laughs) It does. (laughs) Because again, yes, socialization is important in that time. and, And we talk about that. And trying to, um, I don't want to say handhold, but really try to prepare people. And I, I think back a little bit because I was teaching puppy school um, last night and then also did a puppy consult. And it was sort of cool to sit there. Um, Amelia and I were talking about it today. And um, it was sort of cool to go to this consult with the puppy and him like they had questions, but they were like honest and really good questions right so i think some of it is they could have prepared possibly Mm -hmm. for it and again you're talking about the relationship um with the breeder or where you had gotten the dog from which i think somewhat is important because you know um they should know the dogs um 
But the other thing was, you know, they just basically said to me, you know, like, you're the professional, you've been through this, you've trained lots of dogs. And afterwards, like, they were like, felt like, like, they had a whole weight lifted off of them. <laughs> you know, like, literally asking me this, these questions, because there was mouthing, chasing the feet, there was, you know, stealing Kleenex, <laughs> right? We, we know that one, the toilet paper thing. So, um, they seem to have a good breeder because I always ask, I don't know if you ask, I find it interesting as to why people pick puppies sometimes. Yeah, I tend, I tend not to ask no. <laughs> because I, a lot of times what happens in, in uh, class and it, this kind of could be something that we talk about in one of the next episodes. Um, but a lot of times what people do is they spend so much time trying to figure out why the dog is doing a particular okay. thing. Okay, yes. Yeah. But that effort is just better spent fixing changing it changing it, changing yeah. that behavior yeah and so many people and it and I, I often with with rescues and i don't mind hearing the backstories like i'm i'm perfectly fine with that but um so often they they have so much detail in the backstory and i just wish that they they paid that much attention to what's going on right in the moment so you can tell me why this behavior actually started yeah. and start seeing the triggers of those behaviors and and um, where we can actually intercept that and, and change it to something that we're looking for, right? Um, so I, I, I like to listen a little bit, but sometimes I'm like, yeah, don't worry about that. Let's just move on. Let's, let's get to that thing that you're really looking for, right? Yeah, because, and I'll, I'll say that though too in consults, is we're not gonna spend our time trying to figure out why we're gonna spend our time, like you said, fixing it yeah. or changing it. So, um, you know, then we could like a whole nother conversation could bring be bringing in adolescent dogs and stuff. But Mike and I chose to sort of keep it puppy, puppy ish. Right. I don't want to say the majority of people adopt puppies. Honestly, wouldn't couldn't tell you the statistics no, as to know. whether they get rescues and stuff. I just think over the last and if I'm fair to say the eight, 10 years, maybe we are seeing more rescues. Would you say? Well, um, there's been more rescue um, um, organizations, organizations yeah. that have been created around here. So yeah. that definitely brings more yeah. in. There's more funding to do it too. So okay, yeah. like um, there's one rescue in town that just brings uh, rescues through and brings them for vetting in uh, and the GTA area. So then, yeah. And that's yeah. all funded through the GTA areas, uh, Humane Societies and that. Right. So. Yeah, and the yeah. humane societies have become more of a a presence where I honestly think in the states they've been more of a presence a little bit longer mm -hmm. with that sort of thing. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's sort of coming up. I don't want to say coming up in Thunder Day because I find it has definitely been there the last few years. But you know, um, when sort of first getting my dogs, it just wasn't so evident. Like you had animal services and you had. I don't even know if that point we had the Humane Society. Oh, I'm going to date myself, but, <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, so just to wrap it up, um, where Mike and I were going with this is I think a lot of it is planning. Mm -hmm. That's what I want to say mm -hmm. is absolute planning. You know, Mike planned for six months, and then you know I to um, analyze it, and if I get it wrong, just let me know. But then you know found this breeder got a relationship and then a lot of times it's being put on a list it's not literally boom here's the puppy right so it can be a little bit different you know timing wise though too you know whether you're looking for a, a specific thing and sometimes you know there's puppies available sometimes it's not but the main thing we just want to get across whether it's a purebred dog um whether say it's a dog from a neighbor down the way or even a rescue I, I really believe it's planning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's planning and accepting the puppy you have and be willing to learn, um, spending time training and, you know, working together to cohabitate instead of saying, I thought this is what was going to be. Mm -hmm. And then just saying, okay, this is what it is and this is what I'm going to do to help it. Yeah, I mean, I don't know how much you want to go into the planning stuff because we, I, I did talk about that a little bit when yeah. I did the puppy 
can't remember pandemic puppy uh you did a facebook live right yeah but you know there's a whole uh slew of things that you want to do before you bring a dog home yeah uh, in general any dog but puppies especially and and all that so i don't know if we want to go into that at all but well, I think what we're going to do now is we're going to wrap up and I want to end off with this. Mike was actually the first, um, I mentored Mike and I think he was the first like trainer or person I ever worked with when I started training. So we have an interesting history, but maybe that's, <laughs> that's a whole nother thing. So thanks everybody for listening. And remember, if you guys have questions, we are here. Thank you. Thanks.